So our next speaker is an Emmy award-winning journalist and documentary filmmaker who specializes in, in uh, election integrity and social change. Um, everybody, welcome to the stage, Lulu Freisdat. Hey, how are you? This has been pretty amazing. I'm really ecstatic. Just watching people's faces, like watching Phil Stark's face, watch Virginia Martin's presentation, and see this like understanding, you know, of sort of these two um, different types of audits and the kind of um, lead proponents of each really connect and communicate with each other. Watching um, Assemblyman Quirk's face this morning as he listened uh, to. Uh, Lowell Finley. It's been am amazing. So thanks to everybody for being here. Um, I have a lot that I want to cover, so if I'm going too fast, just you know, flag me and say slow down. So this is a photograph from Virginia Martins County, Columbia County, and I'm going to be using her protocol there as kind of an example of what 100% hand count audits could look like. But there's a lot of different examples of what 100% hand count audits look like. I think I'm going to take my jacket off, even though I'm wearing a pink bra. That was a mistake, but I'm hot, so here we go. Woo! Okay. I used to rap, so <laughs> maybe I'll start rapping about election integrity. Um, what, what this presentation is going to be about, to some extent, is a reconciliation of ideas. So we have, I've been doing this, but let's go to the next slide. Um, who am I? I'm Lulu Freistat. I am an Emmy award-winning journalist and documentary filmmaker. I made a film called Holler Back, Not Voting in an American Town. And you can find that film and download it at hollerbackfilm.com. And that was my entry into this field. It really had to do with an exploration of why people don't vote and participate in politics. And what I came to find out was that there's a lot of reasons. And one of the key one was that people didn't believe that the votes were being counted accurately. And I went and investigated that and I was like, oh. Maybe they're not being counted accurately. And I became very concerned. And my concern has only grown since the time that I made that film. So uh, let's move on. I have worked with the major networks. I do work in mainstream media, ABC, CBS, NBC. Um, and then I do a lot of independent journalism. So the next thing I want to do is show a video. You guys have that video queued up. And then this is some notes from uh, after that video. Uh, the woman who isn't here now, and she asked for a consolidated, easy way to communicate this problem. As a journalist, that's one of the things that I've struggled with. And there was a, a congressional briefing, recent, um, not recently, I think it was in May, where some of the really top election security specialists spoke, and I did a consolidated three-minute cut of what were the most salient points from that, and we're going to watch that now. And I think this is the kind of thing that can really communicate to people in a very short period of time, we have a problem, and we do have solutions. So let's take a look at this. We could turn the lights down if more possible. Hacking a national election in the United States would be, well, shockingly easy. We were asked by HPE to figure out how you would break a local and national election. Both of the DRE style and the optical stick scan style machines have been brought into the laboratory. And in every single case, it's been shown to suffer from vulnerabilities that would allow the spread of vote stealing malware. The payload that most of these guys are interested in would be a tabulation manipulation feature using fractionalization and decimalization, which weighs the vote. It gives every vote a certain weight, and uh, that way it looks completely legitimate. How would you do it, just to review? First, the attacker would target states that are likely to be key to the result. Phishing will continue to be the main distribution vector. So this is on one click, so this is what's downloaded into your system and then will migrate laterally throughout your network. Remote access Trojan, a key logger to record keystrokes, a screen grabber so you can take screenshots of what's on the screen, a camera and microphone capture tool so you can listen to what's happening in the office. There are not nearly enough 
people with expertise in election technology security for every county to be consulting with one in making these decisions. And as a result, much of the technology that's in use today has significant and known security problems. Our systems are really old. 42 states are still using systems that are over a decade old. Just because the machines aren't directly plugged into the internet does not mean that they're out of reach for a mildly sophisticated attacker. I've run operations to penetrate air gapping. It can be done fairly easily. The maintenance contractor comes in, he's getting $500 a week, he's being paid $2,000 to take a USB drive and put it in the back of any computer. That's it. It's not really that surprising. These machines are computers. Of course, there are ways that an attacker could try to compromise them. Maybe this is the, the time for a true bipartisan relationship to grow, come, come out of this and go forward. It absolutely should be a bipartisan issue. If you have a system that's resilient, that means that you will still be able to have it functioning. And that can be accomplished with a paper ballot and then to have that paper ballot be audited. Paper is actually a wonderful defense in elections against cyber attack. When we talk about post-election auditing, not all audits are created equal. It's really important that we're doing the types of audits where the ballots are hand counted to confirm that the software counted the votes correctly against the machine tally. Most of the country is not performing those types of audits right now. It's time that we, at the policy level, take this seriously. We need to be in a lot better shape than we are. So if we go back to the PowerPoint, there's just a few things I think you'll... Oh, sorry. Okay. So there's a few things um, that I just want to highlight from that. Alex Halderman there, who's a computer science professor at the University of Michigan, saying this is all machines. This is optical scans. This is DREs. Anytime they have been brought into the laboratory, they have been shown to suffer from vote stealing malware. So no one should feel secure. We need to be checking these machines. Next slide. One of the things that isn't included in that um, video, James Scott was the guy in the white shirt, kind of big bulky guy, he works with ICIT, and he said they were hired by HPE, and he meant Hewlett Packard Enterprises. They were hired to hack, to hack an election, to kind of see and do the research how it would be done. And they did a report called Hacking Elections is Easy, and it's a, um, really kind of a jaw-dropping report. And one of the things that he said in that congressional briefing testimony, election results will be for sale in 2020. Access as a service will be for sale, um, will be available for state tabulators by the next presidential election. And what he was talking about there was um, that, that phrase, access as a service, he went on to describe it. And what he said basically is a hacker gets inside a system through a back door and just holds that back door open for the person with the best price, the person with the political affiliation that they like, that opening will be available, held there, and for sale. And uh, he wasn't saying maybe, he wasn't saying probably, he did the research, he said it will be available for service in 2020. So we need to move on this, we need to move rapidly. Next slide. Um, I also love that Karen brought this up, Karen McKim and her presentation. We have problems with accuracy, not just with hacking. So this was the report that came out of MIT, University of Wisconsin, and the report that um, Karen's team did also. Uh, one out of every 170 ballots in the 2016 recount in Wisconsin was miscounted in the election night tabulation. So we, we have problems, and, and the audits can help us with them. So next slide. What are we going to do? Right? Everybody here, I think, at this point is like, vote on paper. We need the paper and we need to count the paper. So I don't think that's really a question. I think it's a question of how are we going to count on paper? And that's where I think kind of the rubber meets the road and where we have people at a pretty broad spectrum of ideas, even within this fairly small community. And that's what this presentation is, is about. Um, this is another quote from Alex Halderman. He says, only two states currently conduct audits that are robust enough to detect cyber attacks. And the two states he, were ta he was talking about are Colorado and Arizona, I think, where they've started the risk-limiting audits. Oh, New Mexico. I'm, thank you, Barbara. Okay, so New Mexico and Colorado. He wasn't talking about New York, where I live, where we do a 3% manual audit, not, not sufficient. And he wasn't talking about California with your 1% audit. So most of what all of the states are doing is not adequate right now, according to people that we trust are really top security experts. Next slide. 
So there's a couple of different kinds of audits. There's the flat percentage audits. That's what most of the states are doing now, California, New York. Um, and then there's two other kind of audits that have really been described in detail just to the panel before me. And I love it that people are going to be a lot more up to speed on this. One is basically what they're doing in Columbia County. Um, there they're doing a centrally located 100% hand count audit. Um, I know you have a word, what do you say, um, modified. Virginia calls it modified, a modified 100% hand counted paper ballot audit and then risk limiting audits. I'm gonna spend a little more time on the risk limiting audits and one of the reasons why I'm gonna do that is because I think we have a, a more clear idea of what the, of the what the hand count audit looks like. Next slide. So we know what they are now, I think because Phil spent some time with us, Phil Stark, uh, and um, I'm really grateful for all the work that he's done. He's been working on this for a decade and he's a saint. So um, I do this proposal not because I don't support risk limiting audits, but because I do have concerns about them. And I'm not sure that they're for everybody and they're not a panacea. They're not gonna solve all our problems. And they're a little bit of a buzzword right now. And I think it's really important for us to really, as he said, the devil's in the details. And let's really look at what we're getting into. So, um, this is a quote from one of Phil's papers, a risk limiting audit checks some voted ballots in search of strong evidence that the reported election outcome was correct, if it was. So that's from the white paper. So that's kind of like an overview, and the overview is great, but when you get into the nitty gritty details, next slide, um, there are things that I have concerns about with the risk limiting audits, and these are pretty much the three categories, and there's actually a fourth category that I wanna cover also, which is cost. So complexity, security, and transparency, and cost. So let's go into complexity, next slide. So, this is from the gentle introduction to risk limiting audits. Now this is the formula that tells you when the audit can stop, and it's when N, is greater than or equal to this formula. And I say this just to say that the vast majority of the public is not going to understand how these audits work. And in that sense, they don't always meet the threshold of transparency. It's not as transparent as a hand count audit where anybody with no level of education can pretty much come in and understand it. And I understand Phil's point when he says like, with the risk limiting audit, you have a small enough number of ballots that everyone in the room can actually like see that ballot that you're looking at for confirmation. But there's advances in paper ballot counting. For example, in Wisconsin, Karen McKinn's group is doing these slide projector audits. Are you gonna demonstrate that, Karen? Fantastic, I hope everybody stays for that because I'm dying to see it too. Very excited about that. And what that is basically, um, I don't wanna steal her thunder, uh, but if I can just um, give you a preview, they divide the ballots into stacks of 25, and before they were using ballot images, but now they're gonna really use paper ballots. They project them large on a document projector, yeah, and then everyone in the room can see the ballot, and then they click count them in groups of 25, and then, so they go through 25. If everybody got the same result, they're good, they move on. If not, they stop and go back and count that 25 again. But that's, you know, if that, that point was well taken that Professor Stark made that, you know, when everybody's scrunched over the table, you can't really necessarily see the ballot, but there are ways to solve that. This is a complex process which also, entails mastering a very specialized vocabulary that has been developed, at least at this point. The rule depends on the diluted margin, M, the smallest reported margin in votes divided by the number of ballots cast. So you have to understand what the diluted margin is. Suppose the audit has inspected N ballots. I can't really see this. Let U1 and O1 be the number of one vote understatements and overstatements. I'm not gonna read this whole thing. There's a vocabulary that you have to master. Understatements, overstatements, diluted margins. I know, Phil's shaking his head, but it's complicated. Okay, but you had your panel. This is my panel, okay? <laughs> and I, I'm gonna say that there is a level of transparency that is 
is a little opaque. Not everyone's going to understand how these work. It doesn't mean I don't support them. It just means let's be realistic about it. And you've been hammering away at risk-limiting audits for 10 years, and they're not really being rapidly adopted. And one of the reasons may be that it's really a little dense and a little thick. So let's think about some options. And that's what I'm proposing here, is that we can have options. Not everyone has to do risk-limiting audits, and not everyone has to do hand-counted paper ballots. Because we have jurisdictions that are a wide variety of sizes and shapes, and we don't need a one-size-fits-all solution. So this paper is called a two-tier solution, and I'm proposing dividing jurisdictions into two different levels, and one level would do 100% hand count audits, and one level would do the risk limiting audits. And it's just a starting point. It's a proposal. So back to my reservations about risk limiting audits. They're complex. Next slide. And what happens when things are complex? We can have problems. Officials may do it incorrectly thinking they're doing it right. Officials may know they're doing it wrong, but not want to ask for fear of looking stupid. Officials may pretend to implement the process, but not actually do it. Or it may be easier for officials to game the audit, because most voters also won't understand how it works. And we do have corrupt counties, and we do have election officials trying to game audits. That's what happened in 2004 in Cuyahoga County, where those election officials actually were convicted of gaming the audit. So we know it happens. So there are problems with complexity and lack of transparency with the risk limiting audits. Next slide. Security. One of the things, the questions that I asked uh, Stephanie Singer about software checking software. One of the solutions to the risk limiting audits being so complicated is that they're being implemented using software because that solves the complexity problem, because people don't have to understand it, they're using the software. But then you have software checking software, and then you have security issues again, because if you have a hacker, if you have an, an, you know, a, a person with bad intentions or a group with bad intentions that is sophisticated enough to manipulate the voting machines, it's quite possible they're sophisticated enough to manipulate the software that checks the voting machines. So software checking software is a security issue, and I already talked about the transparency issues. Although the other point that I brought up yesterday was in order for the risk limiting audits really to be um, checked by the public, the cast vote record file needs to be released in certain cases. If you do the ballot, if you do the risk limiting audit a certain way, it is unclear if all states will release that cast vote record file to the public in order for the risk limiting audits to be checked. And let me tell you, it is hard to get documents out of election officials. I have been doing a public records request in Florida for a year trying to get access to the ballots in one race, and they are they are obstructing at every single point. We just went into court with them and they lied through their teeth about every single issue. They do not want us to count those ballots. So you can say, oh, there'll be a hashtag and we'll promise you that the cast vote record file was the one that we used in the election. But if we as citizens cannot check the actual documents and the election officials do not want to give up those documents, then we do have, again, a transparency problem. Next slide. So. This is the proposal I'm putting on the table. It's called a two-tier system, and basically it gives each county a designation based on its average number of ballots and standard ballot content in a four-year period. So the two designations would be small limited, large complex. And what that means basically, what's small limited? Small limited is kind of like Columbia County. They've got 40,000 voters there. And through my conversations with Virginia Martin, I came up as a possible demarcation line, 50,000 ballots, or less on average that a county has to count, and maybe 10 referendums or less. She told me they had counted seven referendums comfortably with no problem. So that might be a county that would get a small limited designation. Large complex, you're probably talking about LA with three million ballots. So what would each county do? What would those different designations mean for the actual process? Next slide. So this is a proposal. Small counties with limited ballot content, 
As I said, on average, 50,000 ballots or less, 10 or fewer referendums. Those counties would perform 100% hand count audits of all contested races. That's basically the Columbia County model that you just heard Virginia Martin speaking about in detail. And obviously, there's a lot of different ways that that could vary. As I, um, I'll talk at the end a little bit about advances in the hand counting. So the, I mean, hand counts can go a lot of different ways, and um, we are, we're making a lot of progress on how to do that fast, um, quickly, and efficiently. Um, next slide. Larger counties, as I said, something like LA, those counties might perform risk limiting audits. I would encourage us to go for that 99% confidence rate. I know in Colorado they did a 95% confidence rate. I'd like to see very high confidence rates, 98, 99% if we're using those risk limiting audits. And then, you know, you could pretty easily add to that a 100% hand count audit of one randomly drawn race on the ballot and a 100% hand count audit of any race where the margin of victory was less than 1%. Wouldn't be that hard to add that in. And that would probably give people who didn't understand the risk limiting audits more confidence. And it would also give you a chance to really look down at those nitty gritty details like where um, Virginia was talking about the person had handwritten in below the official line for handwriting, uh, you know, the candidate. You would, you would have, you wouldn't just be doing, when you're just doing the risk limiting audits, you're really not taking that much time to look at ballots individually. But you, if you added in a little bit more hand counting to the risk limiting audits, then every county would be starting to look at, at one race 100% and you would start to find those problems. And you know, I actually think most election officials want to do their job well, and if they started to find those problems, at, and they would start to rectify them, or people like Ray would be breathing down their neck and making them rectify them, so. <laughs> right, so we want to find those problems. We want to be looking in there and seeing where are we having problems, next up. Um, so there are some, a lot of advances that have been going on with hand counting ballots. I talked about the slideshow counting. Um, John Brakey and other people, Ray Lutz, are doing a lot of work about ballot images. I think that ballot images are great and I think it's an added layer of redundancy. Again, I don't think it's a panacea. I think that all of these things that we're all working on, risk limiting audits, 100% hand count audits, chain of custody, ballot images for the public, all of these are gonna create layers of redundancy, transparency, security, and accuracy. And I think we need them all. So yes, let's get the ballot images uh, out to the public and let's, um, let's take a look at them. Uh, Jan Bender's group, uh, Mich Michigan Election Reform Alliance, did some studies, or they did, um, they did some hand count audits and they were using spreadsheets. That's one thing I noticed from your report and that seemed to really help a lot in terms of the hand counting um, instead of just the stick numbers, really when you're putting the numbers into spreadsheets. And when I've had to hand count ballots myself, I found the best way to do it was just to start putting things into spreadsheets because otherwise you do lose track of those little stick figures. So there's, and then her group is also doing, um, or trying to implement a study of ballot design. And one of the things that Jan's pointed out to me repeatedly is that the ballots that we have right now are designed for computers to read. But if we had ballots that were designed for people, <laughs> they would probably be easier to read and it might not drive everybody crazy to, to count them by hand. So there's advances that we can make. Um, I do want to go back and talk about cost a little bit because uh, um, I talked about those three areas, complexity, security, transparency, and cost. The assumption is that risk limiting audits are going to be less expensive, but I think that is at this point at best a question mark. Um, in the comparisons that I did, I actually put together a 25-page paper for this proposal, and I will get it up on my blog, and I'll give it to Jim so anybody who wants to read the full report can take a look at it. I did cost comparisons between the risk-limiting audits and the 100% hand-count audits, and I based those on Virginia Martin's estimate of hand counts costing 14 cents per ballot per vote, and on the costs that were shown in the 2011 California um, pilot. I know, because they don't have the right equipment. That's why I'm saying at best it's a question mark. You should just have Phil up here like shaking his head with everything that I say. Um, so here's, here's the down, you're really getting into the weeds now. It's really hard to estimate the costs of the risk limiting audits as they would be done ideally 
because we don't have the right equipment to do them now. So here in California, you're using these old machines that don't make cast vote record files. And in order to do the risk limiting audits in the most efficient way, you need the cast vote record file. So the main expense of that 2011 pilot project in California was for these different counties to make, like scan, all of these ballots and make a cast vote record file, which was sort of a simulated election, and then they did a risk limiting audit in using that created cast vote record file, and that was a slow, cumbersome, expensive process. So those are the figures that we have right now as an estimate for the risk limiting audit costs. And in every case, almost every case that I compared for my paper between just doing 100% hand count and going through that rigmarole, the 100% hand count was cheaper, and it was cheaper by a lot. So, now again, that's not ideal. Ideally, we're gonna be doing better. We're gonna have better machines, and it's gonna be easier. But I just wanna make the point that it is not necessarily less expensive to do a risk limiting audit than to just do a 100% hand count audit. And, when you get into the you get into the, the way that Colorado's doing it, where they've hired a very qualified team with amazing technicians and security people like Free and Fair to do their risk limiting audits, I don't know what their costs are, but I got to tell you, people that are that smart and that that like that good at security are getting some money. <laughs> so you're not going to get a really good team cheap. So you still might wind up spending more on a risk limiting audit than a 100% hand count audit. I'm just saying let's not make that assumption. We don't have enough information right now to know which process is gonna be cheaper. Move on. Okay, so this is my final statement on this point and then I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about where we go and what I'm doing. There is currently no single more important task for the US elections community than to get meaningful audits in place prior to the 2018 elections. Um, where am I on time? Lucy, have I got like five minutes? Five minutes, okay. I want to make sure and say that we're making progress. We are making a hell of a lot of progress. So I will um, just say one of the things that um, I've done that was a clear indication of process. I went to Wisconsin and filmed the recount there and did some, um, I produced some, pa some video packages and one of them was on some really suspicious activity that was happening in, happening in Racine County, Wisconsin, where um, activists had been click counting the ballots as they were going through the optical scan machines and they were getting major error messages, error, error rates, I think like 5%. And that report that I did led the Wisconsin election integrity team to do follow-up research and they pursued that with the Wisconsin Election Commission and now Reed Magney of the Wisconsin Election Commission said that that reporting was very key in their decision to decertify those optical scan machines. So this is everybody working together. This is me working as a journalist and the election integrity community activists and Liz Whitlock who was, you know, an on-the-ground community activist like going to her recount and clicking by hand and then people pressuring the commission, right? So we are making progress and machines are being decertified. In Virginia, they're decertifying their machines and in Georgia, they are even trying to figure out what they're gonna do with those machines. So I, I have to be, say, I'm encouraged. This is the most progress I've seen in a long time. So I wanna just tell you briefly a couple other things that I'm up to. I am the um, audit team leader on a group in New York that is trying to get legislation introduced by January in New York for better audits, better security, and access to recounts. That push is being led by the New York Democratic Lawyers Council, and I've learned a lot this weekend that I can bring back to that team, and they are hoping that that legislation could possibly be rolled out as model legislation for other states. I'm also, as I said, doing a public records request in Florida. Um, that is for the uh, ballots in Tim Canova's race. It was a race that, um, that was the 2016 August primary against Debbie Wasserman Schultz. My team did a statistical analysis of that race and we found it highly suspect. And I wanna look at the ballots. I wanna see what's going on there. And uh, we've been fighting for a year to get access to those ballots and we were just in court um, last week and uh, 
it's yet to be determined if we're going to get access to them, but we are fighting that. Um, I know there was somebody yesterday who was saying, like, I'm an activist, what can I do? Public records requests are definitely something that you can do and that I think everybody should get more informed about and that we as a group should do educational um, seminars and videos on getting um, people, individuals up to speed. Uh, John Brakey has really been a leader in those public records requests, and I l learned a lot from him. Uh, and also Susan Pynchon in Florida has done a lot of records requests and is a great resource there. Um, so I think um, those are two of the major things on my plate right now. I do also have a, um, I have a GoFundMe up. I really do desperately need funding to keep doing the work that I'm doing. So if you go to go GoFundMe and look under Lulu Freistat, do, um, do feel free to support me if you, if you like the work that I'm doing. And then where do we go from here? I think that what I would love to see come out of this group meeting is a further, um, a coalition really of partnerships and meeting of minds. I think we've had a great meeting of minds this weekend and we need to continue that brain trust and we need to make a plan and we need to get people behind that plan. And as I've said here, it's not necessarily a one-size-fits-all solution, but I do think that if we work together to advocate for a basic plan, we will have more chance of success. And one of the key things that we need to do is we need to reach out to people from all different political backgrounds. The conservatives are actually getting very worried about this issue, and Grover Norquist just wrote a letter of support for the Paper Act, which is is the act that's in Congress right now that mandates things like paper ballots and audits. And when they did this COBAC commission, which I know everybody is kind of in horror about, they had Andrew Appel and Ron Rivest and Harry Hursty all testify for them. And they learned a lot about voting security problems. So this is a really prime time to reach out to groups across the political spectrum and really get a bipartisan, transpartisan, broad-based movement of support that we can really focus on a plan that everybody can get behind and we can try to get some of these safeguards in place by 2018. So thank you so much. Time for two questions. Thanks so much, Lulu, for this big roundup on audits and options. Um, I wanted to make sure people know about some resources, and then I wanted to see if you could add to that. Uh, the congressional briefing, uh, if you want to watch that whole thing, it's on the website of the National Election Defense Coalition. They organized it. They paid for the experts to come. Uh, they did a briefing last year. That's on their website also. Uh, and it's, it's real eye-opener to hear the full testimony. Um, that's electiondefense.org is their website. And that is a very, that's a great website with a lot of resources. Great. And they've done yeoman work on the Paper Act. Uh, getting bipartisan sponsorship, which is mind-boggling in this Congress. Uh, definitely see if your member of Congress has been going to these briefings, and if not, give them a little friendly kick <laughs> to go to the next one. Um, starting in 2007, we formed a working group, the State Audits Working Group. John McCarthy is here. He's a longtime member, as is Phil Stark. Uh, if you're wanting to get involved in working on audit legislation, that group is the think tank on a weekly basis. This is not easy stuff to do. Uh, the Citizens for Election Integrity Minnesota.org, CEIM, they have the most amazing collection of research. What are recount requirements in different states? Which states now have audits and what kinds of audits? They have maintained this for years. And, and you've taken it over. Okay, great. I didn't know if that had fully happened yet. So it's, it's now transferred over. Uh, but uh, <laughs> verifiedvoting.org has taken that over. Uh, Mark Halverson gets a huge amount of credit for doing it for 10 years. Um, so what are some other resources, Lulu, that you found that would be helpful for people as they um, struggle through uh, this 
Wonderland. Thank you. I talk to election activists. I try to talk to people on a regular basis. I've developed email and phone conversations with so many people in this room, and that's how I've been learning what's going on. So I think we need to really keep those conversations going. I do read a lot of the, you know, a lot of the mainstream media is reporting on stuff now. Wired, the New York Times has done several really good articles. Um, there, there is actually a lot of, of decent coverage uh, coming out about these issues. Bloomberg um, has had good articles. So I actually have a, um, I have a Google alert set up for election hacking. And uh, so that notifies me every day in my email of everything that's been covered on election hacking and I find different articles. And there's a really good website, election online. It's electionline.org. So the on from election goes into electionline.org. That is just a basically like straight shot informational library style website of pretty much every single news article that's being um, put out about elections. It's dense, it's kind of a lot, sort of overwhelmed sometime, but you can check that as much as you have an appetite for. There's a lot of information there. So Lulu, I want to thank you so much for coming all the way from New York. Thank you.